Well, good morning, everyone, good morning. and welcome to worship here at the Reformed Church of Stout. Um, you may have noticed that the daily newspaper did not make it in today. <laughs> um, Lee and Tammy both have COVID, so um, yeah, and especially with Anna's situation, we pray sincerely that she for sure does not get it, but um, feel pretty tough, but not you know, not overly severe, but they just didn't get bulletins done and stuff. So, um, so I'm going to kind of go through what's in the bulletin. Also, by the way, um, if Lee gets feeling good enough, he'll put it online for those of you that get the email so that you'll have the bulletin then. Um, our sympathies uh, to the family of Dorothy Taylor, especially to Tracy and her family. Um, Dorothy passed away this week. Um, Visitation tomorrow night, 5 to 7, at um, Council Woodley Funeral Home in Hampton. If you want to know which one it is, it's the one that's right on Highway 3, the old one, what I would call the old one. And our services are at 1030, right, Tuesday or 11, 1030 Tuesday at the Geneva United Methodist Church. So um, keep them in your prayers, and also if you're able to make one of those services, they would appreciate it. Um, next Sunday, I'll be gone to Trinity and Allison. Dale Jansen will be here, so I'm sure you'll enjoy that. Um, one of the bad things about being pastor is I never get to hear Dale speak when he's here. So, um, Randy, will you try to keep him and Larry in line next week? Uh, no, uh, no. That's a lot blind leading the blind there. So, okay. Uh, Christmas program meeting tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Um, Gwen and I might be just a skosh late. We're going to head over to Hampton, so, um, but we will be there. Um, Thursday night is prayer group at Jill and Randy's. Um, on October 9th, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper, and the offering, as always, will go to the Benevolent Fund. Um, the other things, I think, can wait. They're a little bit more in the future and stuff, so um, those are the announcements I have. Does anyone have anything else? If not, let's uh, greet each other and remember when you're done, stay standing for our call to worship and opening prayer. No Sue this morning. I don't see her. I was going to give her her gift this morning, but I guess we will wait. So that's right. Yeah, it's ready. I know. Unless you ladies just want to do a Tuesday at coffee. No. Okay. Yeah, I think so. I mean, <laughs> she blessed us too. So yeah.
All right. Our call to worship this morning actually comes from two different passages. First, from Deuteronomy 10, verse 21. He alone is your God, the only one who is worthy of your praise, the one who has done mighty things that you have seen with your own eyes. And then from Luke 4, verse 8, Jesus answered, he's talking to Satan here, by the way, and he says, worship the Lord your God only and serve him only. Let's pray. Father, indeed, you command us to worship and to serve you only. And this morning, as we come into your house to worship together, may our praises be to your holy name. And Lord, may you be glorified through it. And Lord, may you also say to us at the end of this service, well done, thou good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn of praise, all hail the power of Jesus' name. seated now that our vocal cords are nice and stretched out. Kids, come on up. I got something for you. All right, so I'm going to give you something, maybe something that you guys have never seen, I don't know, um, something that your moms and dads and grandpa and grandmas definitely have seen, okay? And by the way, you get to keep this when we're all done, okay? Oh, wow. So, it's a coin, right? Does anybody know what type of coin it is? 50 cents. Inflation, buddy. Okay, think inflation. Here, let me hold it up to see if mom and dad's. Can you tell from this distance? Silver dollar. Okay, now by the way, they have gold dollars now. I didn't know that. 
I said, I, I wanted a, a, a silver dollar, and they came with these real little ones. I said, no, 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 I want a silver dollar. Well, the first bank I went to didn't have any. The second bank I went to went to the vault and came back with a whole sack full of them. I, I don't know if they're hoarding. By the way, that was Iowa State Bank that had a whole bunch of them, Tracy. So I don't know if you guys are hoarding them or what. But All right, so silver dollar. Okay, have you guys ever seen one before? You have. Why did you say it was worth 50 cents then? <laughs> All right. So these are unusual, okay? They, they were more common when I was your age. Let's just put it that way, okay? My grandma used to give me one every year for my birthday, okay? So I've got quite a few of them stored up. And it just happens, I'm sure she didn't realize that, but some of them, especially when I was young, are worth far more than a dollar today, okay? But these are worth a dollar, okay? Sorry, I'll, maybe someday they'll be worth more. Kelton, I told you to come up, man, but you didn't, so there we go. <laughs> All right? But on the front, we have an image of someone, okay? You can see his face. Okay, and I'm sure you guys don't know. Does anybody know right offhand who's on the silver dollar? John Not John Kennedy, I don't believe. Eisenhower, I heard it back there. Yep, Eisenhower, okay, but there's this image, okay? And that's okay, but if I were to put that on this table, and then I were to get on my hands and knees and pray to that, would that be right? No. Okay? Because God says, I don't want you to pray to any image. I don't want you to make an image of any sort. And I certainly don't want you to bow down to them. I don't want you to worship them or pray to them. Okay? So as you take this home, maybe you can put it somewhere. And when you see it, it can remind you that God wants us to worship him only. Okay? So let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you give us good things, that you give us even money, Lord. We thank you for that. But Lord, we also know that you make it very clear that we are not to make that more important than you and that we are not to worship that or serve that in any way, shape, or form or any other thing for that matter. So Lord, I just pray that the silver dollar would help these young people to remember that you alone deserve their praise and their service as they get older. We just pray for that. We pray that we will continue to teach them well and that they will learn that truth and many others that you have for them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys can go back. We have special music. You are God alone. <laughs> Take that on back. Give it to mom and dad. There you go. <laughs> You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. Just the way it is and You are God alone From before time began and You were on your throne You are God alone And right now In the good times and bad You are on your throne And you are God 
Super Bowl, that's what you are. Let's pray. Father, you are God alone. There is none other like you. And yet, Lord, you have loved us so much that you call us your children. And Lord, just as earthly children often fail their parents, so we so very often fail you. And so, Lord, as we look at the second commandment today, we would pray that your Holy Spirit would come and fill us with wisdom, of understanding, that we would look upon your law in an entirely different way even today, simply because you are God alone. We pray this in your Son's precious and holy name. Amen. So I'm going to be reading, of course, the second commandment from Exodus 20, then I'll be reading from Exodus 32. Um, quite a lengthy chapter, or quite a few verses from found on page 137. And then I'm going to read uh, question and answer 96 and 97, and we'll wait with 98 till we are all done, because I have an assignment for you after the service this morning. So hear the word of the Lord, and I'm going to read, actually I'm just going to read up through verse 4 of chapter 20. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in any form of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children of the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. And then from Exodus chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us, as for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. And Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives and sons and daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. They took what they had handed to him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. And then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. You see what has happened already? God has told them, remember who brought you out of Egypt, and now the people are ready to believe that someone or something else has done this. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day, the people rose up early, sacrificed burnt offerings, and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and to drink, and they got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people who I have brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I have commanded them, and have made for them an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed it to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. And then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians have a chance to say it was with evil intent that he brought them out, to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger. 
relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants Abraham and Isaac and Israel, whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky. I will give to your descendants all this land I have promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. And then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster that he had threatened. Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant of law in his hands. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God, engraved by his finger on the tablets. And I'm going to skip ahead to verse 19. When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burnt, and he threw the tablets out of his hand, breaking them into the pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf the people had burned into the fire, and he ground it to powder, scattering it on the water, and then he made the Israelites drink it. Moses said to Aaron, What did these people do to you that you led them in such a great sin? Do not be angry, my Lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't even know what has happened to him. So I told them, whatever of any gold jewelry you have, take it off. And they gave it to me in the gold, and I threw it into the fire. And out came this calf. Out came this calf. Moses saw the people were running wild and that Aaron had let them get out of control, so they become, became a laughingstock to their enemies. So he stood at the entrance of the cab camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord God of Israel says. Each man strap on a sword to his side. Go back and forth through the camp from one to the other, each killing his brother and friend and neighbor. And the Levites did as Moses commanded, and that day about 3,000 people died. Then Moses said, You have been set apart to the Lord today, for you are against your own sons and brothers, and he has blessed you in this day. The next day Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord and perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses went back to the Lord and said, oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made for themselves gods of gold, but now please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. And the Lord Moses replied to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go, lead these people to the place I have spoke of. And may my angel, and may, and my angel will go before you. However, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sins. And he struck, and the Lord struck to the people with a huge plague because of what they did with the calf Aaron had made. Amen. And then question 96. What is your will for us in the second commandment? And the answer is this, that we in no way make a, may, may make any image of God nor worship him in any way. And this is what the Lord has commanded in his word. And then number 97. May we then make any image at all? The answer, God cannot and may not be visibly portrayed in any way. Although creatures may be portrayed, yet God forbids making or having such images of one's intention of worshiping them or to serve God through them. And as I said, I'm going to keep verse or question 98 for after the message. So this morning, we have before us the second commandment. And if you may have noticed, these are the scriptures. I have no notes for this morning. Because what I had prepared as often as happened in the past, this morning God revealed to me that that was not what he wanted me to say or to talk about this morning. 
The second commandment follows the first commandment very closely. And the third follows the first and second, and we will go on, and you will see why that is important. Last week we talked about having no one greater than God, God alone, as our special music said. This morning it gets more in-depth, and it talks about the worship or the bowing down to such an object or, or even to a creature. God and Moses are having this mountain-high experience, if you will, on top of the mountain. They are talking back and forth. God is giving Moses the law. And life is good. Everything is going so wonderfully. They, they've been freed from bondage. They have the promise that God is going to take them and lead them into the promised land. God is now preparing for his people this, this law, if you will, these guidelines, these things that he wants them to remember, and he wants even more for them to remember how God has worked through each of them in their lives. And then God apparently looks down, and, and I'm sure he didn't have to look down. He knew what was going on, didn't he? And, and he saw what his people were doing. And we read that God's anger burnt inside of him. That he expressed his anger to Moses to the point that he was going to destroy his own people. And Moses steps in and says, Lord, please relent. Don't do that. Remember what you have promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And not only that, Lord, you know what the enemy is going to do if you do that. They're going to laugh and they're going to say, look at this God, this God who... It one moment saves them, and the next moment wipes them out from the faiths of the earth. And God relents. God relents. And afterwards, Moses goes down the side of the mountain, and, and, and he gets there, and he sees what's going on. And now, Moses is angry. Okay? Oftentimes for us, it, it's one thing to hear about what's going on, right? But, but when we see it with our own eyes, then suddenly it becomes real, very real. We were mentioning this week about the Parkersburg tornado, and as I thought this morning, I got the phone call from my mother that Parkersburg had been hit. We had had a family gathering. We weren't watching TV. We didn't know what was going on. And my mom said, it's really bad. So the next morning we got up, we had relatives living in Parkersburg, and we went. And as many of you had to come in from the west, we had to go south there by Poppins, you know, and come in through the, the dip and all these things. But on top of that hill, west of Parkersburg, I could see the destruction. It was more than bad, right? My mom described it the best she could without going into great detail, but what I saw made it so real. And this is what happened to Moses. Moses knew what was going on because God had told him, even though Moses couldn't see it. He knew that it had to be really bad because of God's anger. But when he got there himself and saw it, it, it was so real. And it disgusted and angered Moses so much that he took those precious stones and he threw them to the ground and we read that they broke into pieces. What was the difference between God's anger and Moses' anger? You see, for God it was okay, right? It, for God it was okay that he would even take everyone's life. For God's 
purpose, it was okay for him to be jealous. And we, and we know that God says he doesn't want us to be jealous. And now Moses is angry. And he goes to his beloved ally Aaron and says, Aaron, what in the world have you done? And Moses says, more importantly, why have you done it? And Aaron says, well, you know how it is. You know these people, how, how persistent, how persuasive they can be. They came to me one day and they said, where's Moses? He's been gone for 40 days, okay? 40 days. Does that number sound familiar? Jesus being tempted for 40 days in the desert? Moses has been gone not even six full weeks. And the people, in their minds, decide that Moses is never coming back. He's probably dead. He's had one too many close experiences to God Almighty, and he's dead, and he's never coming back. And actually, we don't know if God will ever come back to us or not either. That was one of Aaron's excuses. The other excuse was that it was beginning of the festivals, of, of the time that the people of Israel would worship God through praise and singing and, and eating food and doing all those things. And Aaron says, God wasn't here. We had to, we had to have something to worship. And so I told the people to take all the gold off that they had and we melted it down and we made a calf. And I tried to emphasize what else Aaron said about that calf. When I read the scripture, Aaron says, and the calf jumped out of the fire. Aaron was implying that that golden calf had life. That it was alive, that it was worth worshiping for that reason. We needed somebody to worship. We needed something to worship too. So we made this calf. And lo and behold, not only was it just an image, but it, it somehow had some life to it. It was, it was worthy of our praise, Moses. As leaders, I spoke to the elders in the consistory this week about how we need to be oh so very careful about the will of the people. Not that you guys are bad folks, okay? Not that you would ever come to us and say, hey, let's melt down some gold and let's make something to worship. But we see it, don't we? We, we see it in, in other places, in, in other churches of worship where popular demand becomes the thing of worship. Where the will of the people becomes more important than the will of God. Because it's fun. It's exciting. We live in a new age, a new world. Don't be so old-fashioned. But I want to get back to Moses. Moses goes back up to the mountain to God to confirm what was going on. And God, instead of coming to Moses' side to, to put his arm around him and to console him and to say, hey, it's okay, buddy, I know what's going on. He doesn't do that. He himself says to Moses, what were you doing down there? Why did you get so angry? Now, if I were Moses, and I realize I'm talking to God, so I, you know, that's an entirely different thing. But if I'm talking to, to Randy Conkin and, and I'm doing something wrong, and he gets angry at me, and I say, Randy, you really shouldn't be so angry because God doesn't like your anger. And then Randy says, yeah, but God gets angry at sin. There's a huge divide there, isn't there? 
there's this huge divide of the difference of uh, who God is and who Randy is or any of us is, who Moses was. There's this huge divide. I read that God instructed Moses to have the Levites kill 3,000 people. 3,000 people. What kind of God do we serve that would command Moses to kill 3,000 people that he had just rescued from bondage and captivity? What kind of God do we serve You see, what God is trying to tell to Moses and wants us to understand as well is that He is God. He is God alone. His just anger is acceptable. His jealousy of not being put lesser than Himself being number one is acceptable. You see, we don't want to be God. Not really. Oh, we, we sometimes think that we could do it better than God. We, we could control things better than God if we just had the ability. We could do it the right way. We could straighten things out. God's saying to Moses and to us, you don't want that. You don't want that burden. You don't want that responsibility. Would you be able to do that? Would you be able to command someone to kill 3,000 men? Do you want that upon your shoulders? Do you want upon your shoulders that you would allow a man to have so much hatred towards one group of people that he would kill thousands and thousands and thousands of them in a concentration camp? Do you want to be the God that allows a lady to get pregnant and then has a miscarriage? Or a couple to get pregnant with so much expectation and so much love and fun anticipation only to find out that that child has a severe defect of some sort? Do you want to be that God? This is why God commands us that no one, nothing, come before Him. Because no one else can handle that. Do we truly understand in our hearts and minds who God is? I don't. I can't understand why God allows so many things to happen. I, I, I I can't fathom why. I can't understand why he allows the Reformed Church of America to be split at the seams over a decisive ish issue. I don't know. I can't understand it. I certainly wouldn't do it that way, I, I don't think, if I were in control, right? God says to Moses, you tried to do it your way. And because of that, there are going to be two punishments for you. The first we all know is the fact that Moses never got to see the promised land. The other one was that because Moses in a fit of anger, in a fit of rage, tried to do it himself, his way, with his mindset, God says, if you want to try to do it yourself, I'm going to command you now that you take and you redo the Ten Commandments. God says, the first time I took my finger and I engraved them perfectly, you had no part in it. But if you think you are and want to be like me, now engrave them with a chisel and a hammer. God said to his people, the Israelites, if you think that golden calf is so alive and so worthy of praise, try to do it yourself. 
We read of the chaos that happened in the camp. We read about how the people got angry at Aaron in other portions of Scripture, nearly killing him. God says, I, I alone am the one that is to be worshipped and praised and glorified in every way. I alone am the person that a knee should bow and tongue confess that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, the God of heaven and earth and of all things. A serious, serious thing that God is giving before us and, and before Moses and his people. And as I said, as we go through the Ten Commandments, this will build. All right, One will lead to another, and, and we will see why each of them is, is intertwined so closely. The project for each of you this morning, and I, I almost hesitate to do this, but we seem to have good conversation at fellowship time, and in Sunday school we talk about issues that we maybe don't all agree upon, right? We can do so in a decent manner. Question 98 of the Heidelberg Catechism. But may not images be permitted in churches in the place of books for the unlearned? Basically what it's saying is can we not have any images of God or anything else in our churches or in our homes? How many of you have the portrait of Jesus knocking at the door? Does anybody have that in their home? Right? The answer to 98 says, no, we should not try to be wiser than God. God wants Christian community instructed by the living preaching of his word, not by idols, not anything that cannot even talk. Okay? So if I read that literally, it means that we should not have any images of Jesus. I'm thinking of our friends at the Washington Reformed Church, the Lord's Supper there that sits in the front, that masterpiece of art. Should we not have that there? Should we not have images of the Lord's Supper? Some would say we should not have the flags. Some would say we should have nothing on our walls at all, no decoration. There's your topic of discussion over coffee this morning. Or does it mean that we understand the difference? When I placed that silver dollar upon the communion table and asked the kids if we should pray to it, they said no. They knew right from wrong. So there's your discussion for the, for the morning and maybe for Sunday school and maybe on the way home. Maybe you'll call the preacher and have a little discussion with him. That's fine. The point of all of this is that God demands that we serve him, that we know the difference. That we know that this is truth. Every single word that it was inspired by him and written down in accordance to his will. That that living word points to Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is the only one that can keep the law, the only one that has kept the law. And he alone is the only way that we can be made right with God. The song, Put Your Hand in the Hand of the Man from Galilee. By taking his hand, we indeed will be able to keep those commandments. Oh, we may falter, yes, we may fail, but in the end, we will keep our eyes focused on him, that we will bow before him, that we will confess him alone. It may mean that we get stepped on our toes a little bit, but that too is from God to bring us back to him. 
This morning we're going to listen to the song I Can Only Imagine. Because as I stressed earlier in the message, I cannot imagine who God is. I understand. I can read about him. And, and I know that he is different than anyone else. But I don't think I can totally understand how awesome our God is. So Dave, I can only imagine. What it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only I can only imagine I can only imagine When that day comes And I find myself Standing in the sun I can only imagine When all I would do Is forever Forever worship you I can only imagine, yeah I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Hallelujah Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine Yeah I can only imagine One of the ways that we are privileged to worship our Lord is to come before Him in prayer. That the God of the universe 
cares about each of us so much that he wants us to come to him and, and share what's on our hearts and that he's willing to listen and that he's willing to act upon our prayers. Uh, the prayer concerns that were listed in the bulletin were um, Tracy had a bone, out, bone biopsy done on her hip on Thursday. Um, pray that uh, those results may give them insight on what needs to be done. Um, the family's asking especially that we pray for Gavin and Blakely as they've learned about their mom being sick and I'm sure you know how difficult that would be for them. Um, Carolyn Johnson had some scarier moments last Sunday um, due to regulation of some meds, but she's um, doing better, right, Dwayne? We also praise God that Dwayne was able to go on the honor flight this week and had a, a wonderful trip, good weather. Um, of course, we'd lift up Tracy and, and Deb and the rest of uh, Dorothy's family and her passing this week. Um, Lee and Tammy, of course, both have COVID, and their main concern is that Anna especially will not get it, so we'll pray for that. Um, pray for safety for the har uh, harvest as farmers get going. And also you have a list in your uh, bulletin, which you don't have, <laughs> yeah, of um, the addresses of our college students. So um, if we probably will just reprint that for next week and get that out to you, but keep our college students and other students in our prayers. Does anybody have anything else? Yeah, Mary? Okay. Okay. All right. So Jeffrey is is done with what needs to be done at San Antonio, except for some tests, for lack of another term. Um, we pray that he will um, get through those fine, and then also as he travels many places to visit people that he loves and cares about. Anything else? Oh yes. Pray for. Um, C.T., I don't know, Carol Tro is his real name, but everybody that knows him knows him as C.T. Um, he had cancer on his stomach, right, and colon, and had surgery to remove much of that. I had a nice talk with him this week one day, so um, he said he's getting better. Everything seems to be working, so um, we'll continue to pray for him as well. Anything else? If not, let's come before the Lord and let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity to come before you. Lord, we can't imagine exactly who you are. Lord, we don't even know exactly how we should worship necessarily, and we certainly don't know how we will respond when we see you in glory. But we know, Lord, that you want us to pray to you and that you answer these prayers. Lord, we pray for Tracy and, and the things that are going on in her body. Lord, we would pray for things that would be learned that we could uh, help her with treatment. Lord, we think especially of our children, Gavin and Blakely. Lord, we just uh, pray that at a young age, they know a little bit, but they don't know so much about what's going on, and, and that concerns them, and we pray that you will give them peace. Thank you for being with Carolyn through her episode. Just pray you'll continue to um, heal her from that and also her shoulder. Lord, we just thank you, too, that Dwayne was able to go on the honor flight. Lord, we pray especially for Dorothy Taylor's family. Lord, we just pray for them during this difficult time, and especially, Lord, um, for tomorrow during visitation and the funeral on Tuesday. May your peace abound, and may you show them comfort through us. Lord, we pray for Lee and Tammy and others that have COVID. We just pray that you will heal them. Lord, we pray especially that you would uh, protect Anna, that especially above all that she would not get the disease. Lord, we do pray for our farmers. We thank you for the bounty of the harvest. We pray for safety. Lord, we just pray, Lord, that as we harvest the grain, Lord, we may do so in a careful manner. We pray for our college students, Lord. We just pray as they try to struggle through a balance of their schedules and, and work and other activities, Lord, that they would indeed continue to have time for you. Lord, we just thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that he has kept your law perfectly. 
and that you have allowed us through him to be brought back to you in whole, made clean. Saints in your eyes, we thank you and we praise you for that. We praise you for all that he does for us. And Lord, we pray to that prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As the deacons bring our gifts of praise forth this morning, let's stand for our doxology and offertory prayer. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord, we return these gifts to you, knowing that they have come from you through your goodness and your blessing. We just pray, Lord, that these gifts may be multiplied, and Lord, that you would be pleased, with, especially with our hearts, as we give them over to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn, number 327, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Father, as we go forth, may we be a blessing to those we come upon. Lord, as we pray for Jeffrey and for CT, Lord, in their various circumstances as well, Lord, may we be your light to them and to a world of utter darkness. For those that have no idea who you are, may we go forth looking upon you and living as you would have us live. And all God's people said, Amen. Our closing chorus, number 457, Lord be glorified. <laughs>